Good afternoon, Hazel, and welcome to Monday afternoon's recording of The Rooftoppers. I hope you've had a lovely weekend, had lots of leisure time, or been really busy if that's what you wanted to do, but whatever you decided to do, I hope it went well for you. Now, we left Sophie and Charles. They had received a very official looking letter, haven't they? And Sophie had just read out the very first part because Charles seemed to be totally lost for words, didn't he? And it had said, Dear Mr Maxim, We, the undersigned, write to inform you of changes in our policy on the guardianship of female persons aged between 12 and 18 years. And like I said, I didn't have a feeling really about whether this... It's going to be one or the other, isn't it? Good news or bad news. So let's read on and find out. So this is chapter five, part three. Sophie scowled. Why do they have to talk like that? She hated official letters. They made her feel nervous. The people who wrote them sounded like they had filing cabinets where their hearts should be. Read on, Sophie. Charles's voice was darker than usual. The committee has come to the unanimous conclusion that a young woman should not be raised by a single man unrelated to her, except in unusual circumstances. In the case of your ward, Sophia Maxim, it was felt certain elements of her upbringing have been absolutely unsuitable for a female child. Oh, that's not boding well, is it? What do they mean, certain elements? Sophie stabbed at the paper with her finger. I don't understand. I don't know, but I can guess. They mean my trousers, don't they? She said. That's mad. They're evil. Keep reading, said Charles. We must therefore inform you that your ward will be removed from your charge and enrolled in St Catherine's Orphanage in North Leicestershire. Non-compliance will result in a court order and a maximum of 15 years penal servitude. The committee's decision is final and effective immediately. <gasps> Penal servitude, what does that mean? Do you know what it means, Hazel? Jail, said Charles. The child care officer of your borough, Miss Susan Elliott, will collect your ward on Wednesday, the 5th of June. Yours sincerely, Martin Elliott. Sophie felt suddenly hollow. She fished about for something to say. They spelled my name wrong. They did. If they have to break my heart, they could at least have spelled my name right. She looked at Charles. He didn't seem to be reacting. Charles? A tear was making its way down her face. She licked it angrily away. She said, please, please say something. So you understood the letter? They're taking me away from you. They're taking you away from me. They intend to try, certainly. She didn't want to touch the letter. She dropped it and stood on it. Then she picked it up and read it again. She couldn't bear that absolutely unsuitable. Do you think if I'd worn skirts and if I didn't slouch or if I was pre prettier or, I don't know, sweeter, would they have let me stay? Charles shook his head. She was astonished to see that he too was silently weeping. What now? She slipped her hand into his pocket and drew out his handkerchief and placed it in his hand. Here, Charles, please say something. What do we do now? I am so sorry, my child. She had never seen a man look quite so white. I fear there is nothing. Quite suddenly, Sophie couldn't bear it. She pelted up to her bedroom, tripping over the stairs. The tears in her eyes were making the world blur. Before she had time to think, Sophie grabbed hold of the poker and swung it at the cello case. It split with a crack. She swung again at the pitcher of water beside her bed, which shattered over her blanket and pillow. Sophie heard an exclamation below, a footsteps running up the stairs. She stamped and kicked. The case splintered and shards of fainted wood flew across the room. If you have never broken up a wooden box with a poker, it is worth trying. Slowly, Sophie felt her breath become more manageable. I won't go, she whispered with each swing. 
I won't. After a while, although the tears and snizzle still ran down her face, they did not choke her. She found a rhythm. Smash, breathe, crash, breathe. I won't go, she whispered. No, smash, no, crash, no. It took her some minutes to realise that Charles was standing in the doorway. Still alive, dear heart? Oh, I was just quite very sensible. He surveyed the room, then led her by the hand to the bathroom. This calls for hot water. He would say nothing else, and Sophie could think of nothing to do but to sit curled on a pile of towels, hiccuping and sniffing, while he put every pot they owned on the stove downstairs to boil and added dried lemon peel and mint to the tub until it steamed. Stay in there for half an hour. I have some things to attend to. Sophie couldn't bear to sit still in the tub. Instead, she stamped to the window and back again and thumped the wall until Charles's voice floated up the stairs. Get in the tub, Sophie, and do some splashing. You will be surprised at what a different splashing can make. Sophie had forgotten that the bathroom floorboards were directly above the kitchen. She sighed and undressed, tugging vindictively at her boots. All right, she called. I'm in now. Having said it, she had to get in, or that would be a lie. That hot water came up to her belly button, and the lemon peel lapped against her legs. Once her body was covered in hot water, all the fight seemed to go out of her body. Sophie sagged and lay in the tub. Her heart sagged too, and she could think of nothing. When at last she clambered out, she made it only as far as her bedroom rug, before her legs collapsed and she dropped down, still wrapped in her towel. She lay there half awake and went on with her staring at nothing. Gradually the nothing changed into a something. A small dot of light was playing against the wall and she had been staring at it unseeingly for many minutes. She turned back to the pile of splintered wood that had once been her cello case to see what was casting the reflection. Then all the blood returned to her and Sophie leaped up. Still half glued to the green bias lining was a long shard of painted wood. Sophie seized it, catching a splinter in her thumb. Ouch! Under the green bias there was a brass plaque nailed to the wood. The light had been glancing off it and reflecting a pinprick of sun on the far side of the room. On the plaque was an address. It was not in English. Sophie had to lay the scrap of wood on the table to read it. Her hands were shaking too much to hold it steadily. Fabricants, Donstremont's Accordes, 16 Rue Charlemagne, Le Marais, Paris, 291054. Sophie found Charles in his study. He was sitting by the window with a newspaper in his hands, but his eyes did not seem to see it. Rain was blowing in and blurring the print on the front page and he was doing nothing to shield himself. Sophie ran to him, but he did not turn round. He only blinked and his dark eyes were blank. Frightened, Sophie clambered onto the arm of his chair, tugged at his sleeve. She later thought she might even have chewed at his eyebrows in a bid to get attention. Look, Charles, look. Slowly, his eyes woke up. He smiled just a little. What am I looking at? This. Charles looked about for his glasses, then, when they did not appear, held it very close to his nose. Le Marais, Paris. What is this, Sophie? It was French. The cello was French. Where did you find this? We have to go to France right now. She was choking and breathless. Today. Sit down, Sophie, and explain. Sophie sat on Charles's feet so he would not be able to move. Her mouth was dry and she had to chew on her tongue until she had enough saliva to talk. Then, as steadily as she could, Sophie explained. It took Charles less than a second to see her meaning. He let his feet, spilling Sophie into a heap on the hearthrug. My goodness! Sweet singing salamander, Sophie! You brilliant, brilliant creature! Why didn't it occur to me that she might be French? I feel I need some whiskey. Oh, goodness me. 
Sophie turned a backward roll under the desk. What if she's living in Paris? What indeed? It's possible, Sophie. I don't say it's likely, my darling. You know that the cello case still may not be hers, but it's just possible. France, of course, my goodness. And never ignore a possible. Exactly. Oh, my darling creature, what a discovery. He looked at the letters still lying on the desk. We need to get out of here at any rate. To Paris? Sophie crossed every finger and every toe she possessed. Of course, where else? Paris. Sophie, quick, to packing. Gather up your best pants and your whitest socks. It was like a bugle call. Sophie sprang up and she said, I don't think I've got any that, that are still white. Then we'll buy new ones when we get there. Paris pants, yes, please. Sophie laughed, but the letter from Martin Elliot was lying on the table. It seemed to watch her. She said, will they come after us? Perhaps, yes, quite probably. That's why we'll leave tomorrow. What, really? Yes, but truly, I wouldn't joke about such things. Charles spread the newspaper open at the page with notices of trade, weather and ship departures. And if they do choose to follow us, or, which is more likely, alert the Paris police, it won't be for at least two or three days. Days? Sophie had hoped for weeks. Surely it would be weeks. Days. We need to be wary, Sophie, but we are at an advantage. He scratched an X next to a column of boat times and high tides and closed the paper. His eyes were glinting with such excitement that it was like warming herself at the fire. Organisations, Sophie, are much less clever than human beings, especially when that human being is you. Remember that. Oh my goodness, that's exciting. So, even though it, the, uh, upon receiving that news, they both reacted in very different ways, didn't they? Sophie sort of, well, she literally hit out, didn't she, and smashed the cello case. That was her frustration. Charles went very quiet, didn't he, and went into himself a little bit. But that just goes to show that we all deal with things differently and in different ways. But that's rather exciting. Now I can see the link as to the children that she's going to find on the rooftops of Paris. So I think they are both thinking now that her mother, if the cello case did belong to her or does belong to her, is living in Paris. That's why they're going to go there. And obviously to stop Sophie going into the orphanage. So that was the end of chapter five. I hope you've had a good first day back at school and I will catch up with you again tomorrow. Have a lovely evening, Hazel. Bye for now. Bye.